It is fine. So, yes, as I don't anticipate, <laughs> you will be there. Um, well, let me introduce you, uh, Dr. Stefan, Stefan Boscher of Siemens. He's the principal key expert in the digital twin and uh, digital twin design and engineering at Siemens. He's a member of Siemens Research, so he's a scientist, as we are, as an engineer too. And well, we've been in collaboration with Siemens at the pleasure to collaborate with Siemens for a few years already. And now, uh, well, we took the occasion since he was here for a project meeting to invite him to deliver this seminar. And I think I keep very short my introduction. So thank you very much for being here. Yeah, you are being okay. So it's also a pleasure for me to give you the talk. Um, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, as Ricardo said, I'm uh, from Siemens Technology. I'll come to that uh, later during my talk uh, when I give a small introduction about we at Siemens Technology are doing in general. Um, first of all, um, I do not go today deeply into the technologies. I want to give you more an overview what we are doing, where we are active uh, in technology, and also what kind of applications uh, we are interested in. So you can sit back, relax, and see a couple of uh, pictures in there. And I also took the liberty to change the title a little bit to make it more appealing and future looking, and also uh, to say, OK, what we are currently focusing on. So it's not so much digital twins in industrial applications. We go one step further. We say, OK, we go into the industrial metaverse. Probably you have heard about this, uh, at least within Siemens, we talk a lot about that. And so, OK, change applications with metaverse and make it more appealing. Um, what is metaverse or what do we uh, understand in, in metaverse? Actually, it's it's just the, the space to experience the digital twins, in our case, for industrial assets. So that's, that's very important. It's not just making it there in a virtual room, playing around with computer games or the algo, but um, we have a serious background and said, okay, uh, we want to explore this technology uh, and see what value is in there for, for, for industry and, and industrial assets. Um, one example that we did recently is this, uh, uh, configurator for the train interior and then okay here you have the possibility to go virtually into the interior of the train see how the uh, arrangement of the seats can be interactively changed and you can already experience yeah, how the train would look like you can change color you can uh, remove seats here and uh, yeah, at, at additional tables in there and uh, more you, know, you see that guy in there so, so that's, that's also interactively so several people can already experience uh, how the new design uh, will be so yeah it kind of comes different design applies to the, the whole Things and I have already uh, a feeling uh, what you uh, can do. Um, so, as I said, uh, for us, the uh, new aspect of Metaverse uh, that we have is that the stimulations and also the uh, yeah, all our acti activities. They, they get this touch of, of immersion that you have to interact somehow uh, with the uh, environment, you sure. need uh, nice 3D visualization. Collaboration should also be included that you not only work yeah, uh, alone on your part, but 
take uh, the, this collaborative aspect in there and, and also simulation should become in the future more and more interactive and this is also the part where we say okay there is uh, a lot of work to be done to make this physics based simulation uh, fast in such a way that, that you get your results as soon as possible so and this is also uh, the point where we see that that siemens uh, yeah, has a, a unique selling point because we on one hand uh, have the simulation technologies but also we know about the products that we sell and this combination is at least interesting for us to do further research into uh, this dimension. Another example uh, here what we did and where it also becomes a little bit uh, more healing or more, more immersive is here uh, also, again, for, for mobility, the, the train we, we do a pedestrian stream simulation. Uh, also, here for the design of the trains, here uh, looking at the doors, are they large enough? Can you uh, change the people from a fully uh, occupied train in, in enough time or going even? One step further, uh, what happens at the train station if a uh, fully new ICE is coming there? Uh, what's happening there? Uh, up to effects like you could see down here that there are a fire. How do the people behave? We are starting to work on uh, yeah, modeling the behavior of people, how they. Uh, behave differently if there is an emergency, then they walk differently uh, like uh, in other situations. So that, that's, that's also some future aspects where, where we are looking on. Um, as I said, I, I wanted also, uh, okay, well, why is this so important uh, for Siemens and our, or actually my boss, uh, I, Mr. Bush said or that he that, that seems to be focused right now uh, on digitalization. Digitalization is one of the key aspects we, we focus on. So it's no longer mainly putting the just yeah, some some assets into the market, but having the digital twins there as well and, and looking at, at uh, digital uh, uh, aspects that can make the, the operation much faster, much better. Um, that's the, the future of, of our company. And this will cover every aspect from, from our company. That's the uh, industry, the infrastructure, mobility, healthcare. These are our main uh, business units that actually where we make most of the money. Uh, out of it, but the digitalization will influence all of these uh, businesses in the future. So this is the, the overview of the uh, Siemens structure. So we have these four main uh, businesses, but also there are some other parts like uh, services where we look at our real estates, at our business services, or we also have a bank and in internal that finances uh, our large uh, projects in there. Um, as I said before, um, we have in Siemens a uh, technology department of central research and technology. I'm not getting okay. Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's, it's not me. Okay. Um, as I said, we, we have this uh, central technology department, which is quite large. So, uh, 2,000 people are working worldwide for uh, Siemens technology in there. Um, overall, within Siemens, around 45,000 people are in RD. So, we Research and development is 
is really one of the key success factors uh, for Siemens. Um, we also have um, in here a large patent uh, department that looks at, that, that all our inventions are also kept safe and, and uh, things for uh, Siemens. And usually we are number one, two, three, depending on the year, on the uh, number of uh, patent applications. And that's so, yeah, we try really to be uh, very innovative. Um, within the Siemens technologies, there we identified uh, several uh, company core technologies, which are the technologies we focus our research on. So there is span from data analytics to integrated circuits, power electronics to additive manufacturing. Uh, or here, the part where I am from is simulation and digital twin. Um, and in this department, and that simulation is one of the key features, but also optimization, visualization, these are our central core technologies where we build, let's say, our applications on, and, and we focus right now on these three aspects that we say, okay, the digital twin, how will it influence or how it will behave during a life cycle of a product. Uh, particular focus is on bringing the simulation into the operation phase. And they said, okay, we have a system tool that supports the, the, the operation there. And quite recently now, uh, we look at this uh, aspects for the industrial metaverse and making simulation even more interactive. And then, um, so this is one part uh, that I usually put into my talks that uh, uh, want to yeah, teach the people uh, that simulation and modeling is actually a, a core competence and, and it's, it's really serious and that you are aware that models uh, models that based on, on observation, on what you see. So you start from your observation, you build a model that, that's a hypothesis how it could work, like you see here in the solar system. But you can also do similar models based on the observations, which prove in the end to be wrong. That's also good. And you can improve the, the, the models. And based on the models, you can do simulation that says, okay, you uh, look at different uh, configurations and the great advantage of simulation is that if you experiment or want to experiment, you can do these by executing the simulation. That's very basic and I think you, you all know this already. And um, we in Siemens, we have a lot of tools to address all the different aspects uh, in simulation, starting from the molecular parts down there to the operation of uh, complete factories, going to turbines in there, going to the mechanical stability of things. So actually most of the aspects that you can think of and that are relevant for engineering are covered somehow with some of our Siemens tools. Uh, this has mainly happened in the last years because we bought different companies and, and, and different aspects. But as I would say, right now, we, we have a quite large uh, portfolio to address uh, the, the relevant aspects. But um, having the tools is not sufficient. You also need to know how to operate these tools. And uh, this article we came across uh, from Andrea uh, Saltelli in 2020. It was uh, done mainly to uh, address the models used for COVID uh, simulation and bring the acceptance for the society in there. Uh, but we like this uh, article so much that I structure the rest of my talk according to these five hypotheses that he put there and, and said, okay, what do you need to do to make these models really helpful for society or 
uh, we would say uh, more for, for the technical applications. And the first uh, assumption or the first use of this, uh, mind the assumptions. That means if you have a model that is made for one particular application uh, and you change the application, maybe your models are no longer correct. This is something uh, that you come across as soon as you say, okay, you have models from the design phase looking at this motor. There in design phase, you want to make the motor most reliable. You're looking at worst case scenarios in there. You, you identify uh, design flaws and uh, optimize the, the motor. If you go now to the applications, you see already that this motor can be applied in many, many, many different applications there. And therefore you have many different operating conditions there. So uh, there in operation, it is now relevant uh, what specific environment you have. If you want to uh, have some uh, yeah, interesting outcome of, of the simulation. You have a specific load condition in there that's probably changing dynamically. And uh, you have also to consider the operating history. So maybe the motor is one day loaded very, very uh, strongly and then not used for half a year. That's a different than uh, being a motor that's used continuously at, at normal loads. So, um, here you see already that, that you really have to consider your environment uh, strongly and, and you have to also to adapt your models uh, if you go uh, from the design phase to the, the operation phase. So it's still work to be done in there. Um, an aspect that you need in the, the operation phase uh, is that you need fast uh, responses. One way uh, where we investigated in was uh, making interactive simulations there. They are not as accurate as the full-blown uh, MPM, but they have the great advantage that you can already get during the design phase some information about the outputs. So a very, very fast, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually a finite volume uh, solver, but it, it's an, it's an fast interactive uh, solver, you, you can already play around with the uh, uh, yeah, with your loading uh, conditions there. Another aspect where we are active now for many years uh, here is model order reduction. That means you have the large uh, 3D models that need hours uh, of space for the evolution. Uh, reducing them by mathematical models uh, to come to what we call now the executable digital twins. That means digital twins that are embedded into the real system and uh, can be used here in our edge devices that the control systems are and help to operate uh, the stuff here. Here is an example for, for an oven uh, where we created this uh, executable digital twin to control the operation of the heating elements to adapt uh, to the conditions how the oven is loaded. This also is an example uh, of why I'm here uh, today and, and what we collaborate here with this Ricardo. Um, in the eFlows for HPC uh, project that they said, okay, we have this special kind of uh, large uh, electromotor with, um, uh, let's say, uh, a very, very specific way of cooling the rotor inside. Um, having a full-blown FEM or, or CFD model, uh, yeah, actually we, we don't have uh, the, the full model yet, but what we could achieve there and, and I mean, it took us really several days uh, for a dynamical ramp up process. So you could imagine, okay, that's not a good uh, model to use in the, the operation phase. And uh, here we work uh, on 
really reducing such complex CFD models down to yeah, real time executable uh, models in here. Um, second aspect, mind the hydrus, that means uh, it's sometimes not necessary to add complexity, but focus on the aspects that you are really interested in. Um, an example, uh, we supported colleagues uh, for the development of the motor for the uh, city Airbus. That was a completely new development of an electro motor, which had to be very, very light by having high power. Um, completely redesigned. And uh, what the tests finally showed was uh, that in for some operating conditions, uh, there have been some resonances in the motor, um, which are not good at all uh, during the flight. So uh, you had to change the design. Um, looking at the design of the motor, you see already there is uh, quite a complex structure in there. And doing even here the eigenfrequency uh, simulation in here, it took really, yeah, maybe or, or usually we, we did that uh, overnight. So we don't use supercomputer, we just use the, the ordinary PCs in there. Um, but starting to do optimization in there was uh, not so promising if you need uh, probably one uh, day for a result. So we said, okay, we just focused on the critical part and did some uh, shape optimization uh, here to uh, optimize the, the eigenfrequencies. And uh, actually the, uh, the boundary conditions were somehow wrong. So the, the eigenfrequencies for the separate thing were off, but we only needed to shift it to upper part and having uh, or knowing that shifting it to, to higher values is safe was high enough uh, here in this part uh, to do the optimization. And I'll make a, some technical deep dive here into the technology that, that we applied. That was uh, also where Kratos was used uh, together with the colleagues from TU Munich, from uh, Professor Blitzinger, Roland Büchner, the team in there, and uh, they have um, or, or has this uh, shape optimization uh, developed now, I think, eight, ten years ago. Uh, they, they started, I, I visited them and I said, oh, wow, that's a, a cool stuff there. And uh, I want to have it, but I don't want to have it as a separate tool. Uh, we tried to integrate it into our uh, engineering framework, and so we worked a lot uh, with them uh, to integrate it uh, into our SimCenter tool. So the general idea is that you start from the initial uh, cut model there, you do the uh, FE simulation, then you move nodes around to uh, yeah, change the structure in such a way that it fulfills uh, your uh, goal much better and reconstruct the cut model uh, backwards and you have the design. Um, this is actually here what you can see uh, here the, the material is shifted just to the locations where it contributes most to the rigidity in here. Um, having just the, the classical optimization uh, for uh, reducing mass, there, that's, that's fine. Other tools can do that as well. Um, last year, we spent some time in uh, implementing stress constraints, something normal optimizers cannot do. So this is a, also a unique selling point. Uh, I said, OK, this is a, a way how we could make this method uh, more attractive because it can do more than the usual uh, uh, optimizers can do, and also here the eigenfrequency tuning. Uh, this was also one of the uh, aspects where I said, okay, 
bringing in a new technology from outside from the universities is only then successful in uh, industry if you can do something that others can't do. Um, and this also yeah, uh, supported for us some internal money that, that we could use now to develop things uh, further. So, so that, that, that's really one of the, that's like making a solver faster. That's nice. Uh, but addressing new effects, that really is the, the, the point where, where we are uh, looking after. Um, okay, mind of framing is something that your uh, moved to your technology that you know and you apply it everywhere. And uh, you should yeah, also think maybe sometimes other technologies uh, have an advantage in that. As, as we are simulation people, they say, okay, we can try to simulate everywhere. And, and in this example, we show, okay, why it is really the, the good technology to apply there and why probably the data-driven approaches are not suitable yet. Um, example is also, again, for a large uh, electromotor, we have the shaft in here, and uh, we want to guarantee the safe operation in uh, yeah, for, for, for a given uh, rotation rate. In this case, uh, it's about between 30 and 40 hertz. And we want to have these uh, resonances in here out of the operation uh, range. Similar like, like before, so what you usually do, you design the asset of this um, and add some additional safety margin and see, okay, resonances are out of it, everything is fine. You can now go um, to the operation phase and say, okay, now in the operation, you only get data from here. Okay, so you do not know anything about the resonance because you want to avoid them. So what you are monitoring is only this area. Now in the normal, yeah, let's say operation, you have some wear, therefore the condition changing. So it's just a shift up here. Nothing wrong, nothing critical. So you see, okay, you can operate your machine in the same way. But if you now use the full model, you see, okay, it's not only that it's shifted a little bit upwards, also the resonances have been <laughs> in here. That's something you cannot extract from the data. Because if you extract it from the data, your motor is broken. So, um, this is an example where I said, okay, here you need a physical uh, model or a physics based model uh, to analyze the, the operation in there. There are other situations where you could do it differently. So, if you do not know anything about the physics or the aspects that are happening there, it's probably not a good idea to build a model on unknown physics there. The measured data are probably the only solution that you have in there. So if you have little domain knowledge, then you should use the data-driven models. Or if you radically have to adapt to different situations and you cannot always uh, update your know, the model, then that's a uh, good approach. So it's also very, very important to have the situation where is the method or the, the technology the most suitable uh, to apply in here. Mind the consequences, that's also some interesting aspect that they say, okay, you need to know about the accuracy of your simulations. So classical example, the salt for the displacement, your model has placed here on the equation, you have an uncertainty of probably, let's say, two person. If you go to the thread, you already have 10% uncertainty. And if you go for the lifetime because of the logarithmic thing, 
your uncertainty becomes 100%. So even if the underlying model is accurate in that sense, by doing different evaluations, you can already come to situations where the, yeah, the, the information gets really uncertain there. You can avoid that because that's a lot of abuses that, that, that you really have this dependency, but you need to be aware of it. So not saying, ah, okay, now here comes lifetime of 4.7 years for, that's okay, that's the result, but you have to say, okay, but this result is very, very uncertain. So look at the, the uncertainties that you have and really be sure that uh, your simulation results can be useful there. And this is especially uh, important in this ever fasting environment, ever faster environment for measurable, for speed and for, for interactive uh, simulations there, that there's a high danger that you get some results, but these results are completely nonsense. Or they are so uncertain that, that you do not know uh, what to do there. So one of the research activities we did uh, now and uh, actually started it last year, uh, that, okay, we want to build a framework to quantify these uncertainties uh, a little bit further. So then there, okay, we collect all the uncertain inputs, uh, like yeah, we have some random uh, variables like manufacturing tolerant material data and so on. We are aware of them, have uh, developed a framework for yeah, actually provide or, or add these uncertain input into the model in there and quantify uh, the output values and so that you do not end up with uh, just a number, but you get a distribution uh, of your results. You can do that in a, a, a classical Monte Carlo way, which is very, very inefficient. Uh, we uh, look at, at different methods as well. Is that okay? Which are the numerical methods that you can uh, use to make it somehow uh, efficient and also uh, use these uncertain outputs uh, to close the loop and have a new sensitivity analysis uh, and uh, calibration in there. So um, this framework uh, we think is very, very important uh, for us, especially now in this uh, metaverse environment because there you, you really need fast results and be aware of how good and uh, how uh, uh, bad probably your, your results are. And even uh, as we as a CMOS, we, we, we usually sell these little gray boxes that do the automation in there. And what we automate, we do not know. It can be assets from all other uh, companies. And here I give you an example where we now develop a framework uh, where we can also include these third party assets where we do only know little about them. So we have a, a high uncertainty uh, about that, but still can um, make uh, yeah, some, some, um, operating uh, recommendations to, to have a, a safe operation there. Um, it's again, motors in the, uh, with our uh, converters in there, but what kind of, of motors are driven by the, the converters is somehow unknown. So uh, we have this is a party product and we only focus on data that we get from the converter, that's the, the frequency, that's the power. And we use data feed information from the motor that, okay, it's that size. And actually all motors look similar somehow. Um, so we developed a, 
let's say, a general motor model in there and um, considered all these uncertainties in there that, that we have because we do not know uh, how the motor behaves uh, and could predict here for uh, a large range of motors the temperature that you had in the uh, for given operating conditions, including the uh, bandwidth of the uh, results. So that okay after yeah fifteen thousand uh, seconds, your end temperature of the windings will be here uh, somewhere between uh, six centigrade, but also in this uh, range. So um, this is already a um, uh, project that we, or, or actually a product that our colleagues from uh, digital industry uh, sell. Um, it is, as I said, uh, focused really on this predictive services, on this digital services that we uh, now provide as an add-on to our uh, converters. So that it makes them, uh, really more yeah, attractive uh, to buy. And uh, so again, the, the structure of this uh, virtual sensing uh, and is here. Again, we have the, the detailed uh, model there. Um, we have the, the parametric set of the motor that said, okay, it's a motor 20 kilowatt in there. It has this size, it has this weight. Uh, all this uh, goes into the simulation model. The model is then reduced and packed into an FMU that is deployed on our uh, controlling units in there and is then part of the control system that's at the premise of the customer there and giving this predictive uh, service analyzers here for the uh, temperatures or so way that we can say, okay, after this uh, operation time, uh, you have a critical or you have a high bearing temperature, so better reduce uh, the load of the motor or say, okay, windings are still okay. So we can probably add some, some extra power in there. So it's, it really gives you uh, a new way of operating your assets because it yeah, is based on the history of the, the operation and also on the, yeah, on, on the current uh, load application. Um, here, the, it's just an, an overview of the, the model. Um, on one side, we have here our, our used uh, thermal model that's based on the 3D model, model order reduction, FMU packed into uh, the, the Amazon uh, product. And we have some additional, let's say, input uh, parameters that, that go into there, that they are all connected here and you end up with the, uh, so, so it's, it's connected here also from the inputs from the inverter, from the data, that we get there, like uh, the uh, rotation rate, like the, the, the power load. And uh, where's the, the output that's uh, the, 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 the ambient temperature? Um, yeah, you end up here with the uh, output temperature uh, from the uh, motor for this specific uh, condition. Um, we also uh, calibrated the, the model that, okay, it, it really fit. And within this uh, yeah, accuracy that, that we said, okay, within 10%, that's absolutely fine uh, for this uh, condition. Uh, we were uh, able to, to verify that this uh, really works out well. Um, okay, we said, okay, not only having external motors there, but parameterize these models as well, so that you can even use a, a fleet of models. That means small size, medium size, large size, that's just the, the scaling in there. So we put some efforts in there to 
identify relations, how the size of the motor uh, relates to the yeah, thermal behavior in there. So that was also one of the uh, yeah, aspects we worked on. And in the end, now we have this fully parameterized FMU where you can yeah, address a whole range of motors. And as I said before, uh, this is already a, a product and we uh, have an installation in Erlangen in one of our factories uh, where this digital twin is already used to uh, yeah, optimize the operation of the uh, location there. Um, okay, that's actually all I wanted to tell you. So I sum up again with these uh, five thesis from uh, Andrea Fratelli. That's okay. It's really, really important if you now go to this uh, metaverse, to these interactive simulations, that you are aware that the assumptions are essential for a successful simulation. Uh, it's sometimes really better to focus on the aspects that you really want to know. So we always call it a, a good enough simulation that's sufficient. Don't get uh, seduced by adding more and more complexity there. Um, the environment and the, the technology that you apply always depends on what you want to do and be open uh, there. And interdisciplinarity is, is really a key. I, I experienced that a lot. We, especially we, we, we had kind of rivality uh, with our data uh, driven people in there and said, oh, no, we can do better, we can do better. Um, now we came to that uh, knowledge, yeah, we both can do better if we work together and, and really uh, take the strengths of, of each of these uh, technologies and apply it in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, okay, to be aware that numbers can be yeah, uh, dangerous. Uh, you have to be uh, aware that they always have some, some uncertainties and you should quantify the effects of these uncertainties in the industrial uh, applications. So that's it for uh, today. Um, have, uh, yeah, I, I hope I gave you uh, an impression what we did. Um, yeah, if you have questions, uh, now is the time. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. I think it is very interesting to see uh, what the role of simulation is in a changing world, as you're saying, and so where our position is. I know that you have a tight schedule, but we have a quarter of an hour for questions. So is there anyone in the audience or online who would like to Um, in the case of digital things, do you always consider your ground through the original model or do you combine it with the real data often? Um, both. So um, it, it really depends. If, if you're in the early phase, then you don't have a lot of data in there. Then the ground truth is only that what you have. That's the, the simulation models there. But the later you come into the, the life cycle, you, where you, you have the, uh, already some tests, some data there, you have to include them. And, and we, we also include them in there. It's, it's even so that we come up with some hybrid uh, models that are somehow based on simulations, but also take into account some measurements, which are always also have to be 
treated with care because they measure only what they measure and not what the, the simulation gives there. Um, but that's one aspect there, or the other aspect is also that the measurements uh, enhance the simulations. And then you have to adapt the digital twins or uh, the good models of the so it will be more like using the real data in order to ensure that your full order model has a better behavior than, than expected and therefore the sort of in in the end it's it's always the reality uh, that has to be uh, true so far. Uh, the, the problem is uh, is often uh, that you cannot define the measurements in such a way that they are suitable for the simulation. So you have to uh, yeah, find a, a compromise and then that, that's often something uh, where a lot of discussions uh, come into the case okay, with the people that have the practical experience there to say, okay, is this good enough? Is this not good enough? For the, uh, for the practical application. That, that's also something where we from the simulation side had to learn a lot. I said, okay, I don't care if your temperature is exact to one degree because I cannot measure it up to 10 uh, centigrades because it's so difficult to place a sensor there. So that's perfectly fine if, if you have such uh, accuracy there because you cannot prove it in the end. It's even so you usually say uh, 120 centigrade, that's the critical temperature for the windings in the, in the motor, but due to production tolerances, or whatever, they can sometimes even withstand 140, 150 centigrade. So it's, it's really a uh, a process of discovering with the practitioners uh, what is really the, the essential part for the simulation. So, comments regarding this, more or less. Where is the, where do you put the limit between, if you, if you run a simulation, you can use a classical way of doing, can you use some experimental result? On, Real data to calibrate the model, <clears throat> so you are not uh, relying on the model, so you calibrate this with the real data. And then, when do you make this the, the jump of okay, I will change the simulation because the data I believe more in the real data or I believe more in the, in the simulation data? And also, another comment concerning until which level are you? Using this, this data in the sense that okay, you change some boundary conditions, you change some material properties, you change the geometry itself. So, what are you changing from the model? And when, where are you putting the barrier of okay, I need more this part or this other yeah. part? Or, um, it, it really depends on, on the, the, the application in there. So, uh, if we think about this uh, motor that the restaurant group for the city airport, uh, there I knew that my uh, optimization model of the rotor is wrong. Wrong in the sense that it gave uh, the wrong eigenfrequencies of the system because it just looked at the, at the rotor. But I knew it is sufficient just to shift the icon frequency to, to a higher value. So wrong model, but right results. In, the, in that case, that was, that was OK. And then in the final design, it was that, OK, we, we checked it with the high fidelity model that included everything and said, OK, now it's safe. It's uh, 120 hertz, that's the lowest icon frequency. That's, that's fine. Um, but in other uh, Examples there, we really had this interaction that is that okay, uh, we started with the first simulation that okay, that gave some numbers in there that are ah, that looks strange. You have to consider this and this and, and add another non linearity <coughs> there until 
we really have car, could cover the whole operating range in there and, and improve the, the model there. And so it, it really depends on the, the question uh, where we are uh, working mainly in the design phase. Uh, there you add more effort into having a right model in there that includes more and more physics also from previous uh, designs from previous ex, uh, experience or from the colleagues there uh, said, ah, okay I know that this or that could happen can you include that in the simulation model as well but in the operation phase where you by nature have a high uncertainty about your environment there the model doesn't need to be as accurate so it's it really really depends um, are you also including changes on geometry or updating of the, to, to be accurate in geometry factors in, in frequency and all these kind of things that where the math is it's really important so that the very small part that it's not important that you're changing the geometry is usually uh part of the design process that is that okay now i'm at here additional mass to make it more rigid to have uh, better cooling uh I think I'm about not not um, expected change of geometry but the geometry of the models and also pieces there are not exactly the, the, the really built piece in that sense are you are you coming the, the 3d pieces in order to update the geometry not, not just the design phase that's for my commemoration it made important that yeah, yeah. The, the geometry of the computer is not exactly the same as the past um usually in, in the cases uh where we use that is that okay that geometry is accurate i i had uh situations where the manufacturing tolerances uh came into play that they had a, a light of uh, complex kinetics there and uh actually what the manufacturer did they usually made the parts a little bit larger. And so they, they were on the, on the upper end of the manufacturing tolerances. And if all the parts are on the same end, then you run into problems because then uh, the collisions come uh, much earlier. Um, that was something where we also changed the, the simulation model said, okay, it was not, in the middle where we expected it, but it was more on the, the upper side. And then you could see, oh, then there is a different uh, behavior. But that was only something we did on reaction on the disagreement with the measurement results. And then you said, OK, now you have to adapt your model to more to reality. Well, Time maybe for one last question, then I'm afraid you yeah. have to rush <laughs> your legs. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a, a less technical question. Okay. Um, you come from Siemens, big company. Yeah. You mentioned trust, which is, of course, and here we are talking about data models together, collaborations. And and then you, you mentioned something about democratizing digital, the use of digital twins. What's your vision about it in, from the perspective of a private company? We are in a university or open source, and, and in this case, what's the vision? Um, open source, yes. I'm also kind of uh, part of our digitalization uh, yeah. strategy is open environments open systems where everybody can contribute in there um one let's say one of the, the main aspects where where we see uh democratization of simulation means to make it available more easily for non-simulation experts starting from suitable ui starting from providing workflows that are easy to apply let's say for a for a designer that he wants to test already in an initial phase okay 
what consequence does my design uh, decision have on the on the final uh, product? So having the let's say the, the FEM simulation already in that tools for a for a low level could be one approach. But looking even further, I said, okay, now you do this part and you can produce this part only by additive manufacturing. Then this has a high impact on costs, on uh, probably also on envi environmental stuff. You use probably a different material in there. So making this uh, simulation <laughs> result more integrated into the, the, the whole processes, that's, let's say, one of the aspects we, we are looking at. We are now quite at the beginning of, of integrating that, but uh, our idea is, yeah, okay, we cannot do that all. So going more into an open ecosystem where different particular tools for a particular question can be integrated into such workflows, that's one of the uh, direction, and I think that the most promising uh, direction to become better and, and to have the simulation more integrated in the in the process. And it will put closely the FEM modeler to the trust. Definitely, yes. Yeah, that's that's also the, the right now the, the FE modeler he is just doing what he should do and, and, and he even doesn't know uh yeah, what the results are used for. Uh, does it okay? Do a FE simulation, does it is it okay? Is it not okay? You often, if you do a simulation, you see much more than you just have to see they say, okay, is it okay? And I said, okay, it's okay, but I know it's it's only slightly okay. If you would improve this, it could add even more. And this interconnection between designers and simulation engineers and, and probably even the, the manufacturing that's not yet there and, and that, that's also one of these aspects in the metaverse they said okay you have to integrate this better so probably it's it's not a purpose of doing fe simulation immediately in a meeting with with, with other people there but having the results there in a format that you can discuss with non-experts and probably do some small modifications and, and get an, an immediate uh, result there for this design discussion so that all the different uh, engineers and different disciplines can work on a really that's uh, one direction where I think okay there is, is really a need for in the uh, actual uh, design process or in the in the operation as, as well um, i just want i need mean, to finish but uh, you mentioned the concept of functional mockup unit or functional mockup interface yeah. and i think that that is very important to us and maybe less known but can you maybe just that one word about this what is the role I think it's it's just a wrapper around any simulation model uh, that you have a standardized interface to integrate different simulations into an, another uh, framework. That's so, so. If you're familiar with probably uh, MATLAB Simulink, so having a, a full simulation there and adding just a Simulink block there where this complex uh, stuff is, is done. Yeah. That's my understanding. I'm mean, also not a an deep expert, but at least a picture of work for every discussion I had with my, my colleagues. And, and that's really, uh, the I think, the, a, a standard that will become the standard for exchanging or simulation models in such an interactive way in an interactive environment. Okay, I'm afraid we need to stop because yes, 
If you have further question, just write me an email, give me a call, text me on LinkedIn or whatever. Uh, I'm happy to answer your questions afterwards. Thank you.